You're listening to Death of the Reader. This is your murder mystery world tour, where we take you around all the inspirations, the influences, the many guises and disguises of the murder mystery world. Today, we are talking Night at the Vulcan, or Opening Night by Nio Marsh, or Opening Night at the Vulcan, as we've decided to call it here on the show. Herds, this ending is... Insane. I would say. Yes. I was, sorry, you caught me off guard. I was struggling to think about how I can summarize my experience with this novel. Like it is a roller coaster as, as many of these stories are that I'm, you know, tasked to solve. But this one, I think in particular really took me for a loop. Mm -hmm. Um, like just to summarize, I was right. First off, it was John Rutherford very impressive, very impressive. With, with the makeup poison in the backstage you area. You can have great. both your points. I will, look, I will take the points. I will absolutely take those points. But I will admit that some of that was through misunderstanding of evidence on my part. Yep. It's not actually Bennington who falls on the stage. It's Percival. Um, the bruise on his face actually comes from Darcy punching him in the mouth, which I did not see coming. But... The real mystery here is how we can wrap up a story with several letters that are the linchpin to the tale, one of which shows up right at the very end, one of which disappears halfway through the story, but apparently is very important and also has a healthy dose of uh, incestuous relationships. Um, It's very, I I don't know how to explain what's going on between Adam Paul and, uh, and, and Martin Tan. It is insane. The thing is insane. They are supposedly third cousins. That's here's the thing. That's the line, the book toast. But one of the characters says early in the novel, like, did you, when you went to New Zealand, did you like have a kid over there, Paul? So I'm just saying there's some room there for some even, even nastier stuff. What is this doing in my murder mystery novel about the theater? The first time through this story, (laughs) I thought that what it said, and it does say this admittedly, is that Bennington thought that they were third cousins. Okay. I didn't realize it had been confirmed until the second time through. It's insane. And I don't know what it adds. Yeah, here's the thing. There are two things that I can see that are, that are kind of being, you know, this this plot point is being used for. One is to dispel any thoughts that Hamilton and Paul are together, which yeah. means that we can't use that line of Paul defending uh, Hamilton's honor, da 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 da, for pinning him as a culprit, and that that ties up that as a as a possibility. There is no doubt in in, in the reader's mind because you know Paul's with somebody else now that he could be, you know, fighting yeah. for Hamilton. That's fine. Um, the other is that, of course, we have a young, you know, lovely female protagonist and getting her into a relationship by the end is great. It's great for, like, yes. warming the heart. Um, it's a classic of, you know, Disney stories, all sorts mm-hmm, of stories. That, mm-hmm. Like, if you have a young character, a young female character, like a princess or, like, a plucky actress, whatever, they're going to end up in a relationship by the end. That's that's fine. That's I, I felt, honestly, heard, mm. like, Martin Tan was a faceless protagonist by the end. Yes, 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 she was. She is given all of the tropes and tribulations Mm -hmm. of a protagonist, but by the end of the story, I feel like I know so little about her other than extraneous detail that I'm not sure, like, why she was chosen. If you had completely removed her from the cast... I don't think functionally it would have made a huge difference to the novel. Yes. Except the the perspective. The strength, let's be very clear, the strength of this novel lies in the other characters Mm -hmm. and in the, you know, the life of the theater, painting the theater as its own beast in of itself, as you've pointed out in previous episodes. But honestly, I was expecting Martin to, you know, have her moment in the third act where she'd suddenly come forward and say, this is, I figured it out. Mr. Roderick Allen, let me tell you how to how to figure out who it is. But she really doesn't. She yeah. just kind of she comes forward and she more or less acts like any other witness in the scene. She doesn't give any more information than than Paul does. Um, she doesn't, you know, give something that might contradict one of the other characters. Uh, she gives a few kind of you know notes that she's gathered, so to speak, from her conversation with Bennington mm. about his letter. That's important, but I really think uh, that she could have used more agency yeah. in the second half, more to do, um, and a bit more of a a bit more of a push. Sure. I think the other thing uh, that very much bothered me with how this story carries through is that the ending mm. it feels so underwhelming. 
It definitely does. It ends with an old man dying on a sofa off yeah. screen. <laughs> like, it's, and then everybody goes home. You yeah. Know? <laughs> it's like one of the reasons that I decided to break this story up the way I did. Because yes, I, I, gonna, I will say, yeah. if you were reading through trying to solve this, you might have gotten through and been like, Felix, <laughs> what? Yeah. What I, was this I was going to bring this up to you because with Money in the Morgue mm. and also with Murder on the Ocean Express, I, I should point out, yeah. we broke those up as gold age detective mysteries with, you know, the introduction of the characters and the murder in the first yeah. part, and then the gathering of evidence and the interrogation of the characters mm-hmm. in the second part, and then the resolution in the third part. But in this story, you've given me the introduction of the characters in the first part, the murder and the introduction of the detective in the second part, and then all of the evidence gathering mm-hmm. and interrogations in the third part, which seems insane to me. Yeah. Why? Why, Flex? The, the <laughs> simple reason... I guess there's there's two main reasons I did it. The first yeah. is that I had enough faith in you that you could do it without the majority of the information. Well, thank you. I you appreciate that. demonstrated aptly. Oh. The second was, is that in a novel like this where it has such a slow burn feel, it takes a while for things to get moving. It takes us seven chapters for the detective to even show up. When we then get to those interrogations, personally, when I was reading it through before I was breaking these chapters up, I just felt burnt out. Mm. And... What I wanted to carry across with my choice of chapters here is I kind of wanted to give, you know, that introduction burst where we had that fantastic depiction of the theater as a character. Mm. And then we had that tense moment where, you know, he's died and now the detective's here and you're left scrambling for information like, oh my goodness, what's just happened? But then as we get from chapter eight to the end, we get into that grindier, you know, series of interviews where we're padding over information that I thought realistically you could find earlier in the story, Mm. which you did. Mm. And then we still at least would have the quote unquote payoff of the ending. Right. Because yeah. there just, there wasn't momentum to me if I stuck those, uh, those interrogations into the middle part. Interesting. Yeah. It seems like you've broken this more up for narrative reasons yeah. rather than solving reasons, which is interesting because I know how much you love the puzzle. Well, but that's um, a part of, because I thought that it was so weak, mm. you know, by the time you get to the interrogations, there's such a one track solution in my mind sure. that, there's the, I I didn't find much joy in going through those interrogations. There were a, there were a good couple of times the first time I was reading through where I actually got to a page and was like, All right, skip. Yes, yes, I actually <laughs> actually feel that they feel a bit too forced. I yeah. think. I think trope. the last thing I want to cover before we uh, mm-hmm. before we move on and get into the mystery down the line sure. is comparing this to Money in the Morgue by Stella Duffy, uh, sure. based off Nio Marsh. I think that Stella Duffy clearly captured the best parts of Nio Marsh's I think writing, so. yeah, because this is mm-hmm. this is allegedly one of Nio Marsh's best novels, mm-hmm. and I'm honestly disappointed. <laughs> but the things I enjoyed about it are all the things that Money in the Morgue yeah. does so well. I think that. Reflecting on Stella Duffy's work, I think she did an excellent job of writing a love letter specifically to Al- Alan as yes, a character. Absolutely, I think that she took Alan as a detective, and obviously, I want to read more of Naomi Marsh's book. See if this is consistent, but I think that she took the original concept of of Roderick Allen as a compassionate detective, and really just went ham on it, and mm. was like, "How can I expand this into a fully fleshed out character and really explore him?" And I think that is the that is the triumph of Selfie's yeah. uh, adaptation there. Yeah. Now it, it should be pointed out because we've been a little bit negative here. Uh, we, we mentioned this novel was actually uh, resulting in, in Naomi Marsh being granted the title of Dame. Um, and it's not just for, for writing murder mystery. Uh, she was she almost single-handedly revived you know the New Zealand's interests in yeah. theater through her novels. Um, so that's what she should be celebrated for, you know, not just for writing murder mysteries, but for reviving theater in, in an entire country, which is really, yeah. you know, it's pretty great. And but, I mean, one of the things that we've said on this show and we'll continue to say is that the best things in a genre is the things that inspire you to check out more of the genre. Mm. The number of people that approached me after we watched Knives Out and were like, hey, what other murder mysteries would you recommend? You know, that speaks to me of a good product. And mm. while I didn't feel that with this book, the fact that other people connected with her stories that way at the time still means that I see them as incredibly valuable even if I don't get personal enjoyment out of them. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. You're listening to Death of the Reader. We are Flex and Herds on your Murder Mystery World Tour discussing the final few chapters of Night at the Vulcan or Opening Night by Nao Marsh. We'll be back with more of that in just a second. (laughs) 
You're listening to Death of the Reader here on 2SER. This is Flex here. And on the line, I am absolutely honored to be joined by author Peter Swanson, who has just recently released Eight Perfect Murders, or if you live in the rest of the world outside North America, Rules for Perfect Murders, a fantastic mystery book that takes all of those perfect crimes that you see raised in the echelons of murder mystery fiction, stuffs them all together into one book as our protagonist, Malcolm Kershaw, is put at the pointy end of far too many of them. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You have a, That's a great um, version of my book you just said. I, I'm going <laughs> to steal it. You're more than welcome to. Now, Peter, the thing that fascinates me the most about this book as a fan and purveyor of classic mystery fiction is the idea that you have assembled these eight perfect murders because that it seems somewhat contradictory to have the crimes of murder mystery fiction as your perfect murders when by the premise of the genre they do end up solved so how did you go about picking these perfect crimes to put into this book well when i was picking them i was thinking um i was thinking of my own personal favorites i was trying to think of murders that came the closest in the world of fiction to um to perfection that had a really clever idea behind them to either misdirect um, the detectives who were um, trying to figure out the case or, and also misdirect the readers. Um, of course, you're, you're completely right. In in the world of detective fiction, most, de- you know, 99% of detective fiction, it's all about um, a detective solving the case in the end. Um, so of course, none of these perfect murders are actually perfect. But um, so I was thinking about the list as, as really clever murders. And I was also thinking, um, who would my protagonist pick? Because Malcolm Kershaw, the bookstore owner in in the novel, is um, creating he's the one who creates this list that is eventually used um, by a copycat um, criminal to um, murder people in real life. Yeah. So you mentioned that these are some of your favorite crimes. I think what uh, what is it about those crimes that really stands out to you as being your favorite? Is there a key method that you like to look into or is it about the construction of the story around the murder that you kind of picked it more from? Um, I think for in this case, and these these are definitely books that I, uh, the, the eight books that are picked are definitely books that I personally love. They're maybe not my my number one uh, mystery novels of all time because I was going with the specific criteria of clever crimes. So take, for example, um, Strangers on a Train has always struck me as this as this really clever conceit to a mystery novel that that if two two people um, who are essentially strangers um, who each had someone they wanted to kill, um, if they swapped murders, knowing that um, the other one would be, a, you know, away and alibied at the time of the murder, then you'd have um, a victim and a murderer that had nothing to do with one another. You could sort of get away with it that way. I mean, in some senses, it's not it's not a very clever um, idea in the sense that you're you're giving all this power to someone else in your life um, that they now know who you want to have killed. But I love the idea of it, and um, so I was I was looking for really clever conceits behind um, murders that would fit well in the book. And then the other thing I was looking for absolutely in the book was. Um, you know, uh, murder novels in which there could be copycat crimes based on them. The other thing that fascinates me about uh, this book is that you are an author out of Boston over in the United States, and yep. there has been an absolute slew of fantastic crime and crime fiction stories coming out of Boston. Is there something going on in the grimy underground of the city <laughs> that is putting all of these fantastic ideas out, like, you know, Knives Out and Elizabeth Elo's works and your works? What is it that it inspires this kind of wave of crime fiction resurgence we see coming out of the... Yeah, the Atlantic Northeast, I guess you would call it. Um, we, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it has something to do with our long gray winters, uh, <laughs> you know, that we, we're stuck inside and what's better than um, either reading a good mystery novel or writing one. So I have something to do with that. I mean, I think... Um, I mean, I I write, my books are set in Boston and they're often set along the coast of Maine, uh, partly because those are two of my favorite places and places um, proximate to where I live. Uh, But I also, I also think they work well in the context of, of murder mysteries in terms of atmosphere and, um, you know, rainy weather and brick lined streets and 
you know, it has um, it has a certain sense of oldness in history, as, as much oldness as you can have in um, United States of America is here in Boston. Yeah, and obviously you've come from a background of writing more thriller type novels. You know, going through uh, the kind worth killing, her every mm-hmm. fear, all the beautiful lies, your other works. Coming to Eight Perfect Murders, which is much more of a throwback to the golden age of mystery right. fiction, which is our home turf here on Death of the Reader. Do you think that there is a resurgence in interest in, you know, old school crime fiction in the modern day with things like, you know, Knives Out? Um, over here in Australia, we have Miss Fisher's Murder yeah. Mysteries. What is it, do you think, that's kind of driving this new interest? Yeah, I do think there's a resurgence. I mean, first of all, there's, all, I mean, you know, these these things kind of ebb and flow. And I think after um, after Gone Girl, we had this resurgence of sort of unreliable narrators and domestic suspense. Um, and it's always a resurgence because sometimes people will say this is a brand new trend, where, where of course it's not. I mean, domestic suspense has been been around for a long time. I mean, Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier is a classic example of domestic suspense. Um, I think, and and the whodunit has has always been around, but I do think it's kind of back in, back in favor a little. I think Knives Out had a huge um, part of that. It just introduced um, maybe even new audiences because I, like my, uh, a friend of my daughter who is, um, she just turned 14 just fell in love with that movie and is now going down a rabbit hole of, you know, other whodunit movies and books. And it's just great to see because there is something comforting about that. So, um, so it was really fun to write this book and write what was right for me, a a little more of a traditional story whodunit storyline than, um, than a sort of newfangled thriller. Did you find that your skills in writing thrillers were applicable to this style of writing, or did you kind of have to, you know, reinvent your own wheel a little bit to to get through the, I guess, more strictured environment of mystery fiction? I mean, I I thought about the book a little differently going in. I knew that if I were going to be referencing these these classic novels, that I needed to have some of the tropes um, of these novels. So, you know, I needed to have um, red herrings. I needed to have, you know, kind of clues out in the open for the readers. Um, I wanted a reveal of the killer. And I also wanted a sort of closed circle cast of suspects. Um, and I think, I, I'm, even though I think it wasn't something I'd written per se before, because I've read so many books um, that have those elements, I think I felt, you know, fairly equipped to do it on my own. And, and also just looking forward to it, because I love that kind of book. I love I love different types of suspense, um, and, and I do love that that kind of um, whodunit. So I was thrilled to you know try my hand at it. Before I let you go, Peter, uh, when it comes to you know switching up, as you mentioned, changing your wheelhouse a little bit and changing your style to work within the classic strictures of, uh, of crime fiction, do you think that you've you know gotten a bite of something that you're going to delve in further further into it in your career, or do you think that uh, you know, this one foray into classic mystery is enough to kind of satiate the appetite and we'll be seeing more of your uh, classic thrillers as we go forwards. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I do, I, I always sort of balancing, um, a few ideas for, you know, upcoming books and some of them are more, um, are more classic and some of them are more thrillery. I, I mean, I think right now I've been, I feel pretty fortunate at book six that I've got in so far away with, um, with slightly di- you know, all, all of my books are essentially books of suspense, but I think I, I've been, but they're quite different, some of them. And I think my next book is, is more along lines of an Ira Levin-esque sort of thriller. Um, and I, but I'd like, I like the idea of trying different things. And I even like the idea of, um, and I haven't done this yet, but maybe a historical, um, uh, mystery, you know, maybe set in the thirties or the fifties again, in a sort of whodunit, um, frame and then try and again, try and find my own particular spin on that. Fantastic. Peter, I'm very much looking forward to seeing more of your work because I'm, I've only just scratched the sur- uh, the surface of eight perfect murders myself as I only found out about it quite recently, but I have had an absolutely great time getting through it and I'm super looking forward to hearing more from you. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. 
If you want to catch any more of Peter's work, you can find his books linked up on the podcast, 2ser.com or your favorite streaming apps. We are going to be returning back to opening night at the Vulcan in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader. You're listening to Death of the Reader here on 2SER. We are Flex and Herds. This is your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we have reached the end of opening night at the Vulcan in the West End of London by Nio Marsh. Glad you remembered all that <laughs> nonsense. I think there are a few more lines. I think there were, but you know what? That's enough for me to remember how painful it was. Yes, <laughs> Night at the Vulcan or Opening Night by Nio Marsh, depending on what copy you have. And yeah. It is time, Herds, for us to break down this mystery. You have received your two points for solving this. I've done it. Because I, as I said in the earlier part of this episode, I set out and I allocated these two points because I thought you could get it in the first part, and you totally did. What? Um, Honestly, that whole ordeal with the reflective skin and the painting, in hindsight, after you pointed it out to me, was like, oh my goodness, that makes so much sense. But the first time through, I was like, oh yeah, we're in a theater. They're talking about theater stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, as I've said, I'm just going to get into the the fairness of the novel. I definitely think it's easy to puzzle through what's going on if you have worked in a theater Mm. and know these kinds of people. Like... I, I judge the letter at the very end of the novel very harshly for being a kind of slapdash way of, you know, saying, this is why I did the murder and this is how I did it from John Rutherford. But his proclamation at the very end saying, if you must chalk it up to anything, Mr. Inspector, it's vanity. Um, and ending it with a, a terribly, you know, pretentious quote, uh, mm. I think speaks volumes to the kind of egotistical people who work in the theater. Yep, yep. Um, and so for somebody to kill someone else because their play isn't going well, mm-hmm. I think that's that's the motive. Like, that's, that's just how it's going to be. Yeah. Um, I think as yeah. an overall premise, it is tidy and concise. I think mm. that the things that the story does, if you just look at it in a broad sense, it, it works. Yeah, sure. You know, it's a theater mystery. We deal with the back and forth of the writing and production of plays. Mm-hmm. There's a lot lying in the motive there, lots of yeah. balancing of egos. And as we've said, you know, describing the theater as a character was fantastic mm-hmm. and juggling, you know, that backstage politics was really, really nicely done. But yeah. just the mystery within it felt so flat-footed. Yeah, it's it's not as well kind of foreshadowed and laid out as I'd like. Mm. Um, like there are technically clues about this Otto Broad character and how apparently John like stole his play and now Bennington's holding blackmail over him. Yeah, yeah. But like it it's it doesn't feel personal. It doesn't feel very present in the rest of the story. You know, we say that in a good murder mystery, the answer should be staring you in the face. Um, not just the how and the who, yeah. like those are easy to do, but the why is a lot trickier to weave into the story. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the novels we covered in the in the past, like I think Murder on the Orient Express actually does a very good job of weaving the why. Yes, absolutely. Um, but I don't think this novel did a very good job of that. Um, and I think part of that is actually because uh, Nari Marsh is trying so hard to keep John Rutherford out of the picture. Yep. Um, whenever he comes on stage, he's very obviously blathering, trying to keep attention off himself. Um, but the only moment that really belies his connection to to Otto Broad, which is the whole motivation for this, is the moment where that he says, you know, do you know this Otto guy? And he's like, whoa, whoa. He's like balking like a chicken and like yep. throwing his pad around. And like, that that's an obvious tell, but it doesn't tell me anything. Exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. And I think that was one of the main things is, uh, you know, as I said, I was very impressed with how you picked, you know, the mm. reflective skin and the use yes. of poison there. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I, I think that it's a bit of a tropey thing, but going back, as we said, you know, it. it set up the tropes. <laughs> so we can't really complain about that too much, even if it is a bit cheesy. But I think that going back and looking at that reflective skin thing, it was only after you pointed it out to me that mm. was obvious. Even having read the solution and going back again, I didn't spot that until mm. you kind of made that connection to yes. me and uh, hon- honestly herds this novel would have defeated me really yeah this novel would oh. have been the one i lost points on look i don't know if that's true let's be clear i think that putting putting you under the wire i, I think you could have done it you're putting yourself a bit too far down there let's be clear the last like we need money in the morgue i didn't think you could do that uh, but you pulled through in the end because, well the, you thing, know the thing is with money in the, the morgue line. at least is that <laughs> money in the morgue i enjoyed it so much that making a theory as ludicrous as that sounded mm. 
I still f- I was still having fun doing it. But yeah. when we got here, if if I was sitting down and trying to solve this novel, by the time we got up to where I think you would have mm. split the book up, I would have probably been just uninterested to the point maybe, where yeah. it would actually get in the way of me trying to solve it. Yeah, maybe. We'll never know, but that's uh, that's, that's interesting to hear. I definitely do find it fascinating that uh, you, you say you wouldn't have noticed all the allusions to, you know, mirrored surfaces and characters seeing themselves in the mirror yeah. all the time. Well, it, it's not that, that I didn't notice them. Because mm-hmm. I definitely noticed them. I just didn't make the connection between that and the actual murder method. Right, interesting. Because I, as I said in the previous part of the show, I thought that it was just, here is... Here's a theatre thing. Yeah, there here's are, a theatre thing. There are masks in theatre, did you know? I mean, yes. that is that is definitely a type. Our characters are a reflection <laughs> of ourselves. I yes. thought it was that sort of deal. All the world's a stage. No, yeah. no. I, I definitely was thinking, you know, Naya Marsh is a person who knows a theatre, so they are going to go as focused on that as humanly mm-hmm. possible. And that's, I mean, that's where, that's where we ended up. I really, really came into this book expecting so much of it. Yeah. You know, all of the reviews that I read basically said that it was a fantastic novel, one of Naya Marsh's best, and the only things that they didn't like was the very unnecessary marital rape scene. <laughs> Ultimately, as I said, I think that we should be grateful for what this novel has set up in the field of crime fiction because there are so many writers, particularly in murder mystery, who are just, like, creatives. Mm. You know, there's us on radio, there's you know, Simon Brett, who also produced shows over in the UK. There's the wonderful teams that have done adaptations of Poirot with David Suchet and then the Miss Marple adaptation, which I think was the same network. Mm. And it has such a strong and deep connection with the artistic field as a whole. And if this is the novel that was yep. one of the seminal pieces for that, I think that it is to some extent an unmissable read yeah. because of the context, for sure. but not because of the content. Yeah, I'd agree with it. You know what I do have good news, though, Herds? Oh, yeah? There is a rule set that this novel breaks. Oh, really? Raymond Chandler's. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> We're bringing it back. <laughs> We're still keeping him relevant. What oh. rule does it break specifically, or is it just all of them? Oh, number four, it must have a sound story value apart from the mystery element. Ooh. It must have enough essential simplicity to be explained when the time comes. I don't think it breaks that, but I think it bends it so hard that we're basically a hook. Yeah. And uh, here's the thing. I'm a little torn on this one. Mm. Throw it at me, Flex. It must baffle a reasonably intelligent reader. Uh. Technically, it did baffle me, but it baffled me not through its mystery. It it baffled you in a way that you were not wanting as a murder mystery reader, and that is the problem, yeah. And finally, it must punish the criminal in one way or another. Well, he died. He dies. So that's a punishment. Is it a punishment? I don't know. Is there no worse fate than death? I mean, here's the thing. In In the technical sense of a story with a structure and a beginning, middle, and end, the villain was punished with death because yeah. of his evil deeds. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're right. He wasn't, like, caught by the police. Uh-huh. Um, he was able to secure his end on his own terms. Um, but I would say that's part of the point. Okay, okay. It's part of the point of the novel. So well, I'm not going to hook him for that one. Either way, I'm just glad that in the first time that my dear father Ronald Knox and S.S. Van Dyne have let me down. Raymond Chandler's there to pick Raymond you up. Raymond Chandler's there. There you go. Pick me up. That's what we needed. We need more Chandler on this show, honestly. I, I agree. should We should plaster up uh, a copy of his rules on the wall and just really refer should. to it first and foremost. I completely agree. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't. I, I reckon we could, we could make some posters out of these detective fiction rules. Graphic you absolutely design them could. Up. Surely those exist. Surely you can get like little not, stickers we're making for them. your car. Instead of like the Ten Commandments, <laughs> it's the Ten Commandments of Ronald Knox. Like surely that exists. Come on. Let's not have flicks and herds if you've seen any of those. I uh, want one. Yeah, me too. <laughs> We, we're going to make it if not. Anyway, Herds, we're out of time here on Death of the Reader. Oh. It's been an absolute pleasure discussing opening night at the Vulcan with you, and congratulations on solving it. You outdid me. Well, thank you. We'll be jumping into something a little bit different for next week. Uh, we'll be taking another boat from New Zealand over to uh, the prime land of, of Australia <gasps> with Miss Fishes uh, and, and the Crypt of Tears. Oh, my goodness. Um, and this is, this is an Australian murder mystery film, actually, that we'll be covering next week. 
uh, and it's based on the works of, of Kerry Greenwood. Mm. Um, I'm really looking forward to this one. We have a lovely femme fatale uh, murder mystery detective. I, I'm, I, I'm, think, I'm I think I think we're taking a lot more than a boat to Australia, Herds. Yeah, we're going around the world is what I'm saying. But my, we're starting in Australia. My family are huge fans of Miss Fisher's murder mysteries. Oh. I'm not quite up to date. Uh, but I am very much looking forward to this film. It came out just Excellent. a few weeks ago, and I am very excited to get yes. in there. We'll be going to see that one in the interim of the next week, and we'll come back with an episode on Miss Fisher, and we'll, we'll see if she lives up to the hype. Absolutely. I'm ready. <laughs> 221 B Baker Street, Sydney. I don't... I, look, I assume so. I'm down <laughs> for that. You're listening to Death of the Reader. <laughs>